Welcome everyone to part two of our series on United States woodland camouflage patterns. In this one, we'll be going over the famous and somewhat confusing pattern known simply as ERDL. We'll be going over all the primary variants from brown and green dominant to the transitional version, commonly referred to as RDF ERDL. So without any further delay, let's jump right in. In part one, we covered the reversible Mitchell pattern and the reasons for its selection before ERDL, even though ERDL predates the pattern by a few years. Now, ERDL is something of a hard nut to crack, with many versions and variants of those versions, not to mention experimental and transitional pieces, it can get a bit confusing and hard to track down every nuanced bit of information. Since there are still quite a few unknowns, contested, and unconfirmed factors, we're going to try and piece everything together in a coherent timeline as best we can. And just a side note, a lot of the different versions were seen on different uniform cuts. We'll be mainly focusing on the actual patterns rather than the uniforms and types of fabric they were printed on. So let's start off simple with the most basic bit. What does ERDL mean? Well, it's actually an acronym for Engineer Research and Development Laboratory. Located at Fort Belvoir in Virginia, this was the U.S. Army's facility where the camouflage was originally developed back in 1948. This would then become the unofficial, sort of official name of the pattern many years after, with it just usually being called the M1948 or just leaf pattern. As mentioned in the Mitchell video, the United States had performed camouflage tests in both 1948 and 1953. These tests were a part of a series done throughout World War II and into the post-war period. They not only trialed various pattern schemes, but also studied and helped to develop the infrared properties of dyes. The main reason for this was advancing technology in night vision and infrared detection. The Germans towards the end of the war had begun experimenting with camouflage that would not only help conceal the wearers to the naked eye, but to also certain infrared devices. The most prevalent example of camouflage was that of the Leibermuster pattern, which many claim was a direct inspiration for the ERDL, right down to certain similar shapes. Created by John H. Hopkins, the chief designer of camouflage at the U.S. Army ERDL facility, this pattern consisted of four colors. Two greens, a light, almost lime green, and a darker green, brown, and finally black. The pattern, along with the idea of full camouflage uniforms, were ultimately shelved, with the Mitchell pattern being adopted for shelter halves and later helmet covers. However, when the U.S. began its support and training of South Vietnamese military personnel, the pattern would pop up once again. Now, it's worth noting that according to a 1979 report titled Camouflage Patterns, Effects of Sizes and Colors, the pattern saw a second version created by Hopkins in 1960. The specifics aren't exactly known as to what the change was, but likely it was related to the coloring, as it would be brought back shortly after for testing. Anyway, in 1962, the pattern was brushed off and put through some paces in the form of a field test referred to as the user review of camouflage for the individual combat soldier in the field, which took place at Fort Benning in the U.S. It was here six uniforms were tested. The ERDL, referred to in the report as USA ERDL 1948 camouflage pattern, the Mitchell pattern, two sets of OG 107 uniforms, one with cloth hats and bandoliers, and the other with helmets and load carrying equipment, US khaki number no. one, and a green British uniform similar to the OG 107. These uniforms would be tested to conceal the wearer not only from the naked eye in ranges from 500 to 1800 meters, but also from video, infrared, microwave, and light amplification devices. Observers were stationed in fixed booths in an open field while the wearers would move around the field at various distances. If you want to read references to the reports, which were part of a larger engineer conference booklet. The link to it is in the description. However, the actual report is somewhat elusive. As you can see, copies of the pictures from this report leave much to be desired. With the final report released in 1965, the testing concluded that none of the uniforms or camouflages worked effectively in concealing the wearers, but the overall winner was khaki number one. However, in 1976, a report outlining the results of another series of trials which cited these tests was released. In it, they explained that the 62 field trials were done poorly and even possibly a little biased, as the tests were conducted in a sparse, sun-scorched field in Georgia. This led the khaki to win, as most of the little vegetation there was was either dead or dying, resulting in it taking on a mostly tan or brownish color. 
Additionally, many of the tests during the 62 trials cited that movement and sound was the primary source of wearers being detected. This led many observers to dismiss the idea that camouflage patterns were effective in the field. However, the final nail in the coffin came from halfway around the world from the Tropical Combat Uniform Board, which met up in Vietnam to make a final decision. While all these controlled tests were being conducted in the U.S., a small field trial was being held inside Vietnam. In 1962, the Advanced Research Projects Agency, or ARPA for short, provided select Vietnamese forces along with U.S. advisors a reversible uniform set that had ERDL on one side and all black on the other. These early ERDL uniforms bared what is now known as the green dominant or lowland variant of ERDL. The idea was that the all black side would mimic the clothing of locals, which were also utilized by the Viet Cong, while the ERDL would serve as camouflage. A number of versions of these uniforms made of different weights and materials were issued in batches to different ARVN forces and were sporadically seen throughout the rest of the war. However, the pattern wouldn't be adopted by U.S. forces, but come 1964, it would be by the Bit Dao Quan, known more simply as ARVN or Vietnamese Rangers. The pattern would be tweaked and turned into two other ones, the BDQ, named after the Rangers who primarily used it, along with Vietnamese ERDL, which was primarily used by airborne forces. We'll be diving into these in greater detail during future videos. Now, in regards to the U.S., a Tropical Combat Uniform Board met in-country towards the end of 1965 to assess the viability of current uniforms. It was here the board rejected suggestions to adopt camouflage already utilized by ARVN forces or to adopt or develop new ones, such as ERDL. Their decision boiled down to two reasons. Troops wearing camouflage were identified easier because of pattern changes during movement, and many deemed solid color uniforms a safer bet as they led to quicker identification. If camouflage was required, forces were advised to alter solid color uniforms in the field by whatever means necessary, which usually included foliage, paint, and or dirt. Although this decision affected a majority of U.S. forces for the next few years, the U.S. Army Republic of Vietnam, or USARV, almost immediately requested 300 uniforms from Natick Labs in ERDL for continued field testing. Throughout 1966, they were issued to certain members of the 173rd Airborne Brigade, as well as the 101st Airborne Division. As these field tests were being conducted, Natick continued to investigate and develop patterns for troops in Southeast Asia. Four were trialed and numerous elements related to dyes and colors were considered and studied, which ranged from the effects of sweat and long exposure to sunlight, to washing and overall wear and tear. Eventually though, ERDL was chosen as the overall winner. Not long after, February of 1967 to be exact, the Army requested 18,373 uniforms to be sent to Vietnam for quote, pathfinders, long-range reconnaissance patrol members, and scout recon personnel. Starting in June of that same year, ERDL uniforms were officially labeled as standard issue four and primarily restricted to special forces based units. They would be seen being worn alongside various other uniform and camouflage pieces, such as OG 107, Tiger Stripe, and even the Mitchell pattern. Now, this is where things get a little bit muddled. These first large scale use uniforms were printed in two versions a green dominant or lowland version, which was closer in looks to the original 1948 pattern, and a brown dominant or highland version, sometimes even referred to as the delta pattern, which saw the colors take on a more earth colored darker tone. But why were there two patterns to begin with? Well, many claim the idea was that the lowland version would be used by forces in more jungle or vegetated areas, while the highland version would be used for more mountainous or rocky terrain. Though this sounds like a good idea in theory, many have pointed out that the problem of having two versions of the same camouflage in the same theater for different terrains is utter nonsense, as the proper procurement procedures for it would have been a logistical nightmare at the time. Now, the actual reason is much more straightforward. According to the 1982 document titled Psychophysics of Modern Camouflage, it is stated that combat experience in Vietnam, however, proved that the pattern was too bright. This was in reference to the original green dominant version. It goes on to say how the pattern was reworked by Natick Labs so that the merged color more nearly approximated the OG color standard. This was then given the designation N Labs 1. 
more commonly referred to as brown dominant ERDL. These uniforms were to be hastily delivered to forces in need of camouflage, but didn't arrive until December, and even then the full amount requested wasn't received all at once. Because of minor production issues such as print roller slippage and batch color variations, numerous variants of these two patterns can be seen in uniforms from time to time. These issues usually took the shape of what many people have dubbed shadows, which can be often seen around the larger shapes in the pattern. It is worth noting though that the brown dominant version did see more variations in its pattern than the green dominant one. Anyway, between 1967 and 1968, these uniforms slowly made their way into the supply chain. Come late 1968, the uniforms had become so abundant that the United States Marine Corps and even certain Army infantry units were receiving them, with even a small number of Navy personnel being able to purchase or acquire them through secondhand means. By the end of the decade, the pattern had made its way in one form or another to just about every branch. However, it still was not technically a large-scale standard issue piece, as a majority of uniforms in country were still OG-107 colored. However, come the 1970s, they were seen more and more, and even started to phase out other items such as Mitchell helmet covers and OG-107 boonie hats. Once the U.S.'s involvement finally came to an end in 1975, the military primarily returned to solid-colored uniforms. Old stocks of the brown and green dominant ERDL, though, continued to be used sporadically, with the brown dominant being more prevalent as it was more suited for temperate environments such as the U.S. and Europe. Many post-war pieces used by the Marine Corps, for example, were taken and had a USMC or EGA stencil added onto the left chest pocket. Though the ERDL pattern was once again downplayed, it did not entirely disappear. No, instead, throughout the 1970s, Natick continued to experiment with various desert and woodland patterns, which resulted in one final ERDL iteration. In fact, it was during this time the start of ERDL turning into woodland was seen, which we'll be covering more thoroughly in the next part. Anyway, with a few close calls involving Israel, its neighbors, and the Soviet Union, the need for a fast-acting response force started to take shape around 1977, with the final wake-up call being the Iranian hostage crisis in 1979. This would eventually lead to the RDF, or Rapid Deployment Force. It was later renamed the RDJTF, or Rapid Deployment Joint Task Force. Acting from 1979 to 1983, in one way or another, these units were often equipped with new or upgraded equipment, gear, and uniforms. One of the most prevalent pieces was a new uniform cut which was referred to as the hot weather uniform. First seen around the mid-70s on trial pieces, these uniforms began being made with the recently created six-color desert pattern, as well as leftover stock of Vietnam-era ERDL, specifically the brown dominant version. Some early uniforms even had both green and brown dominant parts. For example, the bulk of a jacket would be made up of brown dominant, but one may find green dominant pieces inside the pockets or along the front closure. Regardless though, as stock of the old Vietnam era ERDL began to dry up, a new variant referred to as NLABS 2 began to be seen. This variant, often referred to as transitional ERDL, second gen ERDL, or most commonly RDF ERDL, was a sort of stopgap as a more permanent pattern, US Woodland, was still being developed. This version did see a few minor adjustments, with it more closely resembling the brown dominant ERDL, but the most notable changes were the following. The colors were slightly toned down so that they didn't conflict with one another, and the shapes were more sharp, having a more defined edge, whereas original ERDL often saw shadowed or blurred ones. However, much like the previous versions, it would see slight variations over its short lifetime. In 1981, the transitional ERDL was replaced by BDUs and the newly developed woodland pattern, often referred to by its unofficial name of M81, which became standard issue and started seeing a slow rollout. Over the next few years, however, the two patterns could be seen being used side by side one another. But by the late 80s, ERDL had more or less been phased out by US Woodland. Now, before we move on to its use and influence on the world stage, some may be a bit confused as far as the variants, names, and eras of use. So here's a quick breakdown to sum things up. The entire camouflage family is often referred to as the leaf pattern or simply ERDL. The first version though has been called the 1948 pattern, the US Army pattern, green dominant ERDL, 
and Lowland ERDL. This pattern was seen in one way, shape, or form from 1948 to 1966 in trial and limited capacities, but on a large scale from 1968 until roughly 1975, with a few sporadic sightings lasting up until 1983 or so. Then came the second iteration, often referred to as Brown Dominant ERDL, Highland ERDL, Delta ERDL, which some believe is actually another version in of itself, or sometimes in its official records as N-Labs 1. This one was seen from 1968 to about 1983. Finally, we have the second generation ERDL, also known as N-Labs 2, Transitional ERDL, but most commonly RDF ERDL. This one was seen from roughly 1977 to 1983, but continued being spotted alongside U.S. woodland until about 1990. Though the pattern was eventually phased out during the 1980s by the U.S., it actually continued to be used by other countries by way of copies and clones. One of the supposed earliest inspirations based on the ERDL was that of the Soviet TTSKO family, which was introduced in 1981. It is alleged that samples of U.S. ERDL material found their way to Russia, where they were studied, leading to the development of the pattern. Other countries that saw use through copies or surplus were Australia and New Zealand, both of which had special forces units such as SAS use U.S. uniforms, Thailand, Singapore, Taiwan, Syria, and perhaps the most well-known, the Czech Republic, by way of their VZ-95 pattern. As always, we'll be covering each of those particular patterns in due time. But with that, we've come to the end of this part. Check back soon for the third and final one, where we will be going over the U.S. woodland camouflage pattern. Until then, though, be sure to like and subscribe to keep up to date on future episodes of The History Of, right here on Uniform History.